So it is really good to see everybody. Thank you for being here on a Wednesday evening. And uh, for those that are in the troubled corner over here, we will um, keep our good eye on you. Um, I'm going to put Murtis in charge of this crew over here. <laughs> Victoria. I'll, Victoria, I'll put you in charge of Murtis and them. Okay. <laughs> uh, just, so we, just so we get the dynamic straight in the house. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, being here on this, what I think is a very important time that we have, and that's just digging deep into the Word of God. Um, this is by far, I think, my favorite thing to do as a pastor, just to, just to dive into the Word of God. I would say sip coffee and uh, talk about Jesus, but I'm absent the coffee. But... Um, I really do appreciate uh, you being here. Daryl's got coffee. If anybody would like some, um, it's, terrible. it's terrible. <laughs> so uh, um, Dre, welcome to you. We've got young adults here, uh, Miroslav, young adult, and um, me myself, a young adult. Amen. And so um, we welcome all of you for being here. Live stream, comment, let us know where you're watching from. We do not take for granted your participation. And uh, thank you for making this a part. Um, Ronnie, wherever you are, peace, my brother. And uh, for those that are in the house and that can't get out and you're watching live stream, we want to say we love and appreciate you as well. A lot going on, right? We have um, a Tuesday night Bible study for the ladies. Uh, going to be studying the book Boundaries. Sister Beth's going to be navigating the ladies through this Bible study. It's going to be on the 7th of February, 6 o'clock, Sanctuary Kitchen area, as well as um, on the 21st. That's the first and the third Tuesday. Guys, we have our February meeting. That's going to be on the third Thursday of February. We're excited about that. Um, we're just going to be um, doing what Jesus did. We're going to be maybe not sitting by the shore, but we're going to be eating fish with uh, one another, expounding on truth. So how can you beat that, right? So um, that's the third uh, Thursday, and I believe that starts at 630. So um, keep that in mind. Had a wonderful time of baptism last Sunday, baptized three in a chilly bucket of water, and uh, um, I was super excited about that, and have some more that are interested in being baptized as well. Always excites me. That just allows us to see development and maturity. Also, we're having a growth track coming up real soon. We have um, individuals that are showing interest and in asking about church membership. And my idea of that is to go through a growth track so that you understand who we are, what we believe before, you know, you just say, I want to be a part of that. Um, it's very important to me that we all have that kind of understanding and biblical knowledge. So um, we're excited about that. Yours truly is coming up. I mean, it's right around the corner. The 10th and the 11th, the 10th, we're going to be meeting at Wolf Bay Lodge. Dutch Treat. If you don't know what that is, uh, you can see Ethan Pettis um, sometime afterwards. He'll be glad to explain that to you because he now knows what that means. And um, you, you tell him, you tell him I, I sent you to ask him what does Dutch Treat mean. And uh, we're going to be having some uh, teaching in that setting as we have secured a banquet uh, hall you can have a variety of different food, so it's not just seafood or it's not just um, steak. It's a variety, so I think it's going to be appealing to everyone. If you've not signed up, either by the QR code afforded to you or online, uh, and you want to do it old school, please see my wife, uh, because I barely know who I am half the time. So um, she will be a better resource for that, and we are... Um, looking forward to just some time together. The content that I feel like the Lord's directing us to is going to be very, um, very good. It's, it's going to put instruments in our hands uh, that is going to help with just 
daily living and um, just relationships in general. So please keep all of that in mind. A very, very busy month. But um, everything that is going on has to do with depth of the word growing together. And wow, aren't I excited about that? I really am. Um, there's a lot of health here at the church. Wonderful day Sunday. I'm believing God for a supernatural outpouring. Here is um, just some, um, let me see, post <clears throat> testimonies of two Sundays ago when just healing virtue started flowing. I've had several people, and that's not evangelistically speaking, but I've had several people come to me and say, since then, I've not had to take pain medication for the pain in my body. Um, I haven't had any pain. I feel like God is working something in my life. And just a lot of testimonies coming from that. And isn't it wonderful that we do not have to conjure up, we do not have to create or manufacture a move of God. He's ready when we are, and I am just excited about what next Sunday is going to hold. Whatever God wants to do, uh, suit me just fine. We could be raptured someday. Hey, what a way to go, right? What a way to go. And so there is a lot of need that we have in our church. Um, people that are sick, people that have been diagnosed with terminal illness, um, individual families that just need financial, domestic, relational uh, healing and help. So um, just a lot of needs. So as you go about your day, be led by Holy Spirit. Ask Holy Spirit um, what direction, who may you need to pray for, maybe do you need to pray for. And it's intriguing how Holy Spirit will just bring people to your mind and you don't even know the situation. But um, I would encourage you, if you're filled with the baptism of Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, use that gift. Allow Holy Spirit uh, to intercede to the Father on behalf of needs that you may not know, but you can articulate um, and communicate the will of God very easily that way. So um, super, just super excited about Sunday, anticipating God to just work in signs and wonders and... Um, so let's be in prayer for that. All right, what you say, we turn in our Bibles to um, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter number one. Now, um, as is um, typical for my speed of teaching, we are around verse number four and five. And, um, but why, you know, Savor the flavor, right? Mm -hmm. have, have you ever, um, when I cook, and which it's not all that often, but um, I try hard. Well, now it's a little more often than what it used to be. Um, but I, I like for people not to inhale it. <laughs> Ethan, Ethan can eat a meal in, you know, 0 0.2 seconds, mm -hmm. be wiped. No, not, well, that is the second comment I made about Ethan. I better hop off. I'm going to have to owe him some money or something. <laughs> I see a pledge to speed the light coming on. <laughs> but uh, he can inhale his food. It's like, you know, have you given your taste buds the opportunity to celebrate? You know, do they, have they been invited? <laughs> have they been invited to the mill? Or is they... <laughs> But... You know, um, so if you have a banana split, why inhale it? Let's just mm -hmm. savor the cherry mm -hmm. and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll move to the pineapple there and then the caramel. Mm -hmm. Shout amen, somebody. And then the banana. That's right. I'm, I don't know, but I'm ready for mine, right? That's right. Man, my mouth's watering. So Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus. They are not a perfect church. And I'm glad they're not because I've never pastored a perfect church because every church I've pastored, I've been a part of that church. So, um, you know, if it was perfect, I lended imperfection immediately. Um, Paul's situation was no different. Paul is a, he is a intellect, spiritual intellect. He's an intellect of law, 
of um, the Roman law. He's intellect of um, procedure and protocol, but yet he lends imperfection as he comes in and starts writing. God doesn't need perfection. He just needs availability. And Paul afforded that to Jesus. So, um, and to Holy Spirit in the most um, inopportune, uh, in a most inopportune season and situation. So, in verse number one, I'm going to be reading out of the ESV, and we have talked about um, his greeting, why he greeted as he did, which lended some insight. And it, this greeting starts like this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse number two, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we want to move to verse number three where we've been talking about the spiritual blessings that we um, entitled, I, I really don't like that word because it's, um, it's taken on a different connotation in our culture, but we are entitled to because we're adopted into the family, right? So not in a negative way entitled like we are deserving of it, but we are entitled because of the price that was paid in the adoption. So we're talking about um, that inherited entitlement to the blessings. He says in verse number three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We um, expounded on that in great detail last Wednesday, even in verse number four, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, it is very important that we capture um, the introduction to the predestined. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to praise, or to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And so we have talked about the heavenly man living in this dimension of blessings. What you have does not make you blessed. Um, what you do not go through does not make you blessed. It is the knowledge of who you are in Christ. So that knowledge and awareness of the adoption and right relationship with Jesus Christ allows us to understand, regardless predicament or prison, we are blessed and to be able to look at it through a heavenly perspective gives us lenses that we can see the ability of God working in ways that other way, otherwise we could not see. So I wanted to um, bait you last Wednesday, and I did with a D.L. Moody quote, and um, I've just kind of been meditating on that. Um, you don't have to say a lot. Uh, to come across smart, you just what you say has just got to be good, right? Uh, the more you say doesn't make you smart, but if you say little and it makes impact, that's um, that's that's pretty good stuff. That's why I, I preach twenty minutes instead of an hour and twenty minutes because you just condense it and hit it and then you go. So I'll repent later. Um, so. What we're dealing with is the difference as we're moving into this discussion of predestination. It is something doctrinally that um, some people have bought into, and I say that respectfully, okay? 
I, I really do. I say that respectfully. Um, and they have um, lined their belief system up with this doctrine of predestination, which simply is saying this in their view, that there are some that God has already predestined to be saved, okay? And if you're not a part of that, tough luck, right? And if you are, then that's good, okay? Now, I am... I, I do not wish to do this doctrinal belief and injustice, nor to do what others do to Pentecost. There are other reasons why they have this idea, and I am going to touch on some of the obvious ones, okay? It is not my purpose to go through the exhaustive um, doctrine of predestination. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to allow us to read this with a whole understanding of the word predestination, how it unfolds in context with the text that we are reading without this doctrine um, leading us in a different uh, way of thinking, okay? Because... For me, when I read predestination or predestined, that's the first thing that comes to my mind, and I work my way through that. So I do not want to take for granted that everybody understands or anybody understands. So if you do and you're well-versed in this, um, do not think that I am challenging your spiritual intelligence because I am not. I just, I don't know who's listening on live stream, and I really don't know... Um, the depth of um, knowledge that we have here. So I, I really don't wish to take anything for granted. So let's talk about predestination. Um, the scripture that a denomination uses for predestination is not only this one. They fuse some more in there. But um, I will just kind of go over a few things. We want to talk about the difference between, and I shared this with you uh, last Wednesday, between the doctrine of election and man's responsibility. The doctrine of election and man's responsibility. And I want to quote again what D.L. Moody said. Um, I wish I would have thought of it before he did, but I didn't. So I want to give kudos uh, to the one who uh, said it. D.L. Moody says, the whosoever wills are the elect, and the whosoever wants are the non-elect. D.L. Moody is saying in very few words that everybody can be the elect if you elect to be, okay, makes sense. I'm, I'm not. I'm not wanting to just play around with the words, but if you do not choose salvation, then that um, that doctrine of election or that responsibility that you have supersedes what God's will for your life is. Okay. God would that none should perish. That is scripture. I feel like when Jesus came, sent by God, and he willfully surrenders to that commissioning to be the sacrificial lamb, when he does so, he does so with the understanding that his blood is for all. It is for the Jew, it is for the Gentile. Um, it, it is for whosoever will. John 3, 16, God loves the world. He gave his only begotten son that, and here is this word that is incorporating anybody and everybody, whosoever will, um, can come, escape, torment, and have everlasting life. 
So I, I want us to embrace this fact that God wants everyone to come to the knowledge of his saving grace. It is Bible that if anyone goes to hell, and let me make this very clear, there is a real hell, there is a real heaven. This is not mythology, this is not man-made doctrine, this is truth. So, in taking the whole context of the Word of God, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you have one complete story, and that is man is hopeless without God. So God redeems man by sending his son, who is perfect, to be a sacrifice so that we, humanity, can have a right relationship with him being God. This is done through the sacrifice that is foreshadowed in the Old Covenant sacrifices. Everything that priests have done, the ceremonies, um, how they did, the robes, the way they washed, all, all of the um, sacraments, everything, the order of it is all a foreshadow of who Jesus Christ is to the present day church. So when we understand that we believe in the whole council, so if you take the word in its totality, it is my firm belief there is no way when the author says, amen, that you can come away with he loves some, but others, he's just going to let them go to hell. No way. Because from the old covenant married to the new covenant, from the kings to the apostles, from the priests to Jesus Christ, our high priest, from the first Adam to the second Adam, we find that there is a completion of, of the love of Jesus Christ that has been demonstrated and personified through the sacrifice on Calvary's cross. So I want to encourage you, as you read the word of God, make sure that you do not pull out of scripture one thing and put it over here, make it doctrine. You have to take the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God, okay? And when, um, for instance, we do not make a doctrine, and I've said this before, but in, in this venue of teaching, um, in this venue of teaching, it will suffice to say that, um, okay, I just wanted to make sure this was working. It will suffice to say that um, there are certain things that happened like in the New Testament. They happened. It was God's working, but it's not doctrine. For instance, um, Peter healing by his shadow. That's scripture, is it not? Mm -hmm. he, he, went, he went out and his very shadow healed those that his shadow was cast upon. Now, why is that not doctrine? Why do we not have shadow healing as a doctrine? That's a fair question. Mm -hmm. It is because that if it happens once, it is for the miracle. It is to show the supernatural. If it happens um, sequentially, more than once, and you find a pattern, now it's doctrine. Okay? okay? Do, you, do you see the difference? Amen. If not, then we could make fishing for money a doctrine. Okay? Now, I'm cool with that, 
but I, and I might even be able to grow a church that way, right? <laughs> um, and if you don't catch fish with money, your faith isn't strong enough. I don't, I don't, how do you work that? I'm not sure. But the reason why that is not doctrine is because it is not in the totality of the work of Christ. It is some of what was done, but it is not doctrine because it is not done systematically. Why do we believe in healing? Because it was done in a continual way. You can find pattern through Scripture. Are you with me? Mm-hmm. This, see, this, this is stuff that we, we just need. Okay, then why do Pentecostals say um, speaking in tongues is doctrine? Because when you see Holy Spirit come down, there, there is the evidence that is always backed up by the fact they began to speak with other tongues. It doesn't happen just once. If it just happened one time in Scripture, let's not make that doctrine, right? We, we, we can't make that. So um, it, it is when you find continual pattern in Scripture, that's doctrine, okay? If it happens occasionally, then that is a miracle. Yes, it is. But doctrine is something that Jesus has done um, systematically for a pattern because Jesus works as a pattern. Mm -hmm. Look, this is a pattern. Mm -hmm. There is no guesswork concerning this word. Jesus shows us how to do, what to do, the way to do. There's no mystery on how to be saved. There's a pattern right here, Mm -hmm. right? There's no mystery on, um, on how to live a victorious life. The pattern is right here. The patterns are established for us in Scripture. It is just to find the understanding. Now, why did I go on that trail? Because you will find that there is not, and I want to reemphasize that, not a pattern of God through Christ or God, through priests, prophets, kings, judges, saying yes and no. To the elect Israel, yes, he did. Okay? We we understand that is his chosen. But what you find out through the perfect work of God, through Jesus Christ, he says there's no separation anymore. We are all grafted in the vine right? What was an enemy to God before, now they have direct access to God like we do. Mm -hmm. So it is important that when you look at predestination, you, and I hope you don't think that I'm just hitting this and hitting this, but it's, it's necessary for me when you look at a belief system that you understand how we derive doctrine. It's it's very important because you can make doctrine out of anything, anything. So it is doctrine. We know two times Jesus said, I want you to do exactly like I'm doing. Baptism, communion, okay? And then there were times where he showed us through patterns. It did it there, there. Yes, I see that pattern. Yes, I see that pattern, okay? Okay. So um, if you have any questions concerning that, you can see me, you can text me, we can have a phone call, cup of coffee, whatever. And so um, this is where we are, and this is how I want to approach the predestination, okay? This is how I want to approach the predestination. The purpose of God, and we established this last Wednesday, and I don't want to go back and redo what we've already done, But we have established that God is eternal, and that messes with my head, and um, it doesn't take much to mess with my head, but that really does. Uh, You know, when eternity is over, that's the first day of eternity. What? So um, I just choose to believe it without trying to really comprehend it. So we understand that in the past eternity, God always had people at his top priority. It was never about 
things or a place. It was never about a world. The world was created so that we could enjoy it. God's purpose was not the world. It was us. Adam and Eve, he created this for Adam and Eve because he loved them. He wanted to give them the best. So everything is created with the center theme of this word of God, love. God loves humanity and goes to the extreme to make sure that humanity has a plan of redemption and grace. So, the very centrality of this word of God is John 3.16. That is the whole, um, it's, it's the apex, it's, it's, the, it's the very um, nucleus of everything that orbits around. Healing orbits around the love of God. You see, baptism orbits around the, everything that is given to us is orbiting around the love of Jesus Christ. It is that magnetic force that brings everything to the cross. The cross is nothing but the symbol of love. Nothing but the symbol of love. So, all right, predestination, here we go. So when you look at this, we know that from the very beginning of time, God wanted everybody to be saved. Everybody to be saved. So to me, that gives me hope for um, your children, my children, the wayward, the prodigal. The word of God is very clear in making sure that we know we've got a way to the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he is carrying out this divine purpose now through the dispensation of Holy Spirit. Old Covenant, this was God manifesting himself through covenants, Ten Commandments, law. Through the New Testament, now we have the second of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, made flesh, dwelling among us. He is the living word that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record in the Gospels and the Apostles write about. Now, after the resurrection and Luke's record that he ascended to the Father and angels are looking at disciples said, why are you standing here gazing? I still remember that message Ethan preached uh, concerning that one phrase. Why are you still standing here looking up? You know, he's gone and he's coming back. So now we're in another dispensation where Holy Spirit is carrying on the purpose of Jesus Christ, who is the sacrifice, and God the Father, who is the one that ordered all of this. We are living in this third dispensation where Holy Spirit is carrying out the work that God intended before in past eternity manifested in the Word of God revealed even in us today, okay? Now, I, d I don't want to get into all of the eternity aspect and lose you and me both there because this isn't Scotty to beam you up. I don't have one of those devices to bring you back. But the whole message of the church is to be light, salt, bread, water. If I can just put it very charismatically, Jesus in skin. That's our purpose. And the only way we can be that is to be empowered by Holy Spirit to be that. The reason why Holy Spirit empowers us is to be soul winners. Do you see the corporate effort of the Trinity is one thing. Souls. Empowerment given by Holy Spirit to the New Testament church isn't so that we can speak in tongues. That is not. That is a byproduct of the purpose, which is I need to empower you to be witnesses. Witnesses 
For what? For the purpose of God manifest through His Son, I am going to enable you to be witnesses for the lost. Okay? So, I, I want to show you... Um, I, it's very rare that I do this, but just because I am um, OCD for some reason about this, to lay foundation concerning doctrine. I want you to look with me at 1 Peter. If you have your Bibles, um, I, I will wait for you if you do not have your Bible. <laughs> uh, those of you live stream, I can't see you if you're running to get it right now. But um, feel free to. And um, if you can quiet the things around you, uh, Regina and I needed to talk uh, just to talk. And she says, we need to go somewhere so we can talk. Why? Because the Lord thought that I needed a puppy. And um, Max has not found a home. And, and I'm, I'm exercising discerning right here in this house. I'm feeling <laughs> something real strong. I've got to wait for the interpretation to come, but <laughs> Max just thinks that he is the center of attention. He's a puppy, he's a puppy and he needs that. He, if he's not sitting in your lap trying to lick you, he's wanting to fetch the ball. And if he's not fetching the ball, he's trying to untie your shoe. If he's not trying to untie your shoe, he is gnawing at your your pants. You know, it's just something. I'm like, stop, 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 stop. Quit. Leave it. <laughs> What's the command? Quit. <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah, pop him on the nose, and um, I, I'm not sure. You can tell I'm I am a dog whisperer. So, um, so we went somewhere to have supper so we could actually talk without me correcting Max. And in that, I just, um, in that we had to find, we had to find some things in a quiet time that we could get some patterns for. And it, it's necessary. God does not want you to just roam around aimlessly. We're not clueless church. Do, do you understand? We, we, he, his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light, we're not tripping through this thing. <laughs> we're, we're not stumbling, you know, hitting the ground and, you know, fumbling for our glasses because we can't see. There, there is reason. And I want you to hear this as we dive just a little bit deeper. Listen to what um, Peter has to say. Chapter number one, I'm going to focus on verse number two. But if you don't mind, since I'm right here, let's read his greeting. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, I want you to back up because that's very wordy, okay? And it sounds very churchy. So I want us to back up and I want us to see a pattern that is established here like it is established in the book of Ephesians, okay? So after he um, addresses those elect in exiles... We are not talking about just those that are hand-picked elect. We are talking about those elected that have a knowledge of this resurrected Christ, okay? And he says, after he calls them, according, watch the phraseology here, to the foreknowledge, okay? This is knowledge that God has before the occurrence is manifest. Now, we know that God is in all time frame. He is God of the past, the present, and the future. So, Peter is saying, along with Paul, according to the foreknowledge of God, and here's this relationship again, the Father, because of Jesus Christ, we've got that relationship, the Father, now the Son. He says, 
in sanctification of spirit. We have a knowledge or God has a knowledge of us in the sanctification of spirit for what? It is for everyone to the obedience of Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. What is he saying? This is the will of God for everyone. And he has established this by God, just like Paul did, the Father. Here we go, relationship and not religion again. Relationship, the Father. And he says, this was for known by God the Father for all of you. This is not something that he's just come up with. This was his plan the entire time. So he says, in the sanctification of the Spirit. We know that's the dying. The sanctification is the getting closer to God as the old man is dying away. Now, we teach this is progressive. This is, I'm closer to God today than I was yesterday. So he is saying through the sanctification of the Spirit, what for? So everybody can be obedient. So you can be complicit to the will of the Father. He is not saying for just some and not the others. This is what God is wanting for all of us. There is a pattern established here. You can follow it all the way through. That this isn't for just the Jew. No, sir. Amen. No, sir. Peter was predominantly directing his message to the Jew. Paul says, wait just a second here. Right. Come on. This isn't for just those that claim him. We're all sons and daughters now because of the sacrifice. So Peter is saying, I get it. You know, the Jews are the elect. We understand that. Paul is saying, but wait for it. We are all engrafted into the vine. It is not just one part of the body. It's all the body that's fitly joined together. So all of this is stated. I lost my, it's back there. All of this is stated so that we can see that it's not just for the Jew. It's not just for the Gentile, but it's for Every one. I just thought I lost my wallet. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, you're kind. It, that's, that's just the heart of a servant. He wanted to make sure I had what I needed. Um, so, yeah, he, he, wanted, he wanted to make sure that his readers knew in Peter that this is something God did in the before not something he's having to do to catch up. I want you to go with me to Acts real quick. It's very necessary that we establish patterns here. It's very necessary that we establish patterns. Um, God wants everybody to be saved. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad, listen, sometimes we're hard on the church. Let me say this, sometimes I'm hard on the church. Because I was raised in church. And I think the church, I, I really do feel like we don't have m much excuse. Okay? We, we just don't have much excuse. And um, I think that we have been doing a lot of the blaming uh, concerning the reasons why we're not as to uh, the perplexities of the world. And come to find out the world's always been crazy. Right. I, I mean, it's just different stuff, uh, but they've always been crazy. It's always been crazy. The church has never lived in utopia. It's always been battles. It's always been fights. But God sent his son to die for the church, too. And he reminds me of that, because if I'm hard on anybody, it's not the drunkard. It's not the it's it's not the you know, the dope fiend. It's not that one that's trying to figure out where in the world he is and has done some messed up things. It's those that know better that, you know, sit on padded seats, yeah. have the knowledge, but just are too rebellious to do anything about it. Yeah. And God reminds me, I, I died for the Pharisees. I died for the religious. I died for the church, Steve. Don't you dare forget it. <laughs> it's more than just the harlot and the hypocrite. I died for everybody. 
So um, let, let's go on. Acts chapter number 27. Acts 27. Believe it or not, I may get through with this. I'm not real sure. Don't hold your breath. Um, but let's look at this. Acts 27. Now, Paul is in a pickle. I say he is. Me reading it, he is. This is where he's, um, he's about to be shipwrecked. Um, and you, if you don't, well, I'm going to read it. 22 through 24. Why well, ask you to turn if I don't read it? Yet now I, that's being Paul, talking to the captain of the boat, um, who is not listening, mind you. But now I, Paul, urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and, be, um, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Now, there was trouble after that proclamation. There was trouble. And the trouble comes in where Paul says, you will be saved if you stay on the boat. Everybody that stays on the ship, I have been assured you're going to make it. Okay? Now, if you jump off, God didn't tell me what to say about that. But um, truth be known, there was another story, a guy named Jonah. It didn't work out so well for him at first. But he says, God said he will give me everybody that stays on the boat. God is saying to Paul, if you... Now, let, let's, let's watch this. Did he predestine all of them to make it to the other side? The answer is, if they stayed in the boat. If they stayed in the boat, they could make it. Now, we know that the boat went to shambles. Right? We know all of that. But everybody made it to the shore. Not one was lost. Here's the thing. We have the opportunity to stay on the boat. That is your prerogative. That's your choice. But then, if you do not stay on the boat, does that mean that God did not predestine you to make it to the other side? Absolutely not. He predestined you to make it to the other side, but there were contingencies there. You got to stay in the boat. There, look, and I, there's another denomination that says this, and there's more to preach than I've got time. There's an, another denomination that says this. If you become saved, you can never backslide. Okay? Mm -hmm. You can never backslide. But can I tell you another atrocity to me that's just as bad? Is what I feel sometimes in some Pentecostal churches. That there is no security in your salvation at all. Come on. <laughs> you will make it if you stay in the boat. I'm not saying that your fingers are not going to be like prunes, but you're going to make it. I'm not saying that your hair's not going to be messed up, but you're going to make it. I'm not saying that you're going to look like the beauty queen, but you're going to make it. Charles Greenaway, first missionary of Alabama, says you may not look like much, but you're going to get there. <laughs> you, you're going you're gonna to get there. We're going to make it. The thing is, I think there's error in both extremes. To think that you can't lose your salvation for anything or that, dear God, if I blink twice, 
then I can lose my salvation. And we don't have confidence or peace at all. And we're living in jeopardy. Oh, dear Lord, did I think wrong? Did I do wrong? And, and I just don't think that I'm worthy enough. And then there's that other aspect. And I don't know what's worse except to say they're both in error. Amen. They're, they're just both in error. So when you look at when you look at predestination, what I want you to get is this. There is nowhere in this Bible where God predestines anyone to go to hell. That's right. I haven't found it. It's not fair. I haven't found it. Now, if he gives me an opportunity to go to heaven then there is a hell to shun because we know that whole story of Lucifer and his arrogant self and God showed him, right? Third of the angels, so here we go. But if there is a heaven to gain, there is a hell to shun. So this is not, this is a matter of taking the totality of Scripture. If God predestined people to go to hell, I think that there would be more clarity, I would hope, or I would be pretty upset if I tried my very best to live according to Scripture and the guy ahead of me made it, but I was number 2023 instead of 2022. I'm picking numbers out of the air. And he's like, nope, sorry. That is not the God that I read here in Scripture. Now, I know that there's scripture out of Revelation that they also take. If you don't mind, I will not dive into that because of time's sake. But I will tell you that if you take the whole counsel of God, what you will find is Genesis will lead you to Calvary. Calvary will lead you to an empty tomb. An empty tomb will lead you to the right hand of the Father being occupied by the Son. Yes. And that will lead you to the hope that we have in everlasting life in Jesus Christ. Okay? So you can take this pattern and you can apply it in so many different areas. And, and I'm just taking a couple. Mind you, this pattern is seen elsewhere. Um, Isaiah talks... Uh, and, and I, I, let me, all right, let, let's hit this real quick. Let's, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach right up to the minute, if that's okay. Turn to Isaiah 22. I mean, shucks, you got in the car and came, so why not we make use of every minute of our time? Isaiah talks about a nail in a sure place. Okay, this is prophetic concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 22, Isaiah 22, verse number 23. Those of you watching by live stream, this is a little unusual for me uh, to read this kind of scripture. Usually I just rest in the text and we unpack it. But for this sake and to show pattern in a different dimensional way, um, I feel it necessary. Verse number 23, 23 in verse uh, chapter number 22. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him like a, pe a peg in a secure place. And he will come or become a throne of honor to his father's house. This is a simile because the reader is going to understand what a nail in a sure place means. It refers back to the tent life that um, they lived in a nomadic scene in just their culture. And what would happen is they would take a peg and on one of those upright poles, they would um, put a peg in a sure place or in that upright pole, and there they would hang their blankets, and they would hang their garments. And sometimes um, women, and th this, is, this is not uh, um, being prejudiced, 
But back in the day, their primary um, means of work was with utensils. So that they would put their utensils on these pegs. And now scriptures pictures all kinds of vessels hung on these nails fastened in a sure place. And it says, and they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house. He, Christ, is that nail in a sure place and there lies everything that would lend certainly, uh, certainty rather. Christ has accomplished redemption. That's the nail. Every time you need to hang something on there, it's there. It's a nail in a sure place. And he says that nail is Christ and thereby all of our righteousness is hung upon Christ, that sure place where that post is in that tent. He is that sure place. So when we look at this, I will just simply say to you, from Noah's Ark, I, I, there is no doubt in my mind, Noah did not preach all of those years for just he and his family to be saved. That door was open for anybody who would come in. The whosoever was those that went in. The whosoever wants are those that did not go in. And I will say to you, it will, I believe, give God the greatest pleasure for us to take that nail in a sure place, that confidence that we have in the work of Jesus Christ. He is our redemption. I don't have to wonder where to hang that. He is the redemption for all humanity. He is the hope for all humanity. And whatever needs to be placed there, it is strong enough to withstand the weight. As I, I looked at this and I said, God, that nail is Christ. That cross is even, look, I got to quit. Even in the cities of refuge, it's another picture and type of this. If, if there was somebody that committed a accidental murder and they were in a city there were i forget was there seven of them seven cities of refuge six five seven i, I don't know um so don't quote me i i think there might have been i preached a whole message on it years and years and years and years ago and it preaches but those cities of refuge if the one that was fleeing from the avenger of the brother or sister or whoever was done wrong. Back then, it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that family member had the right to avenge the shed blood of their family member. But these cities of refuge was set at a place where anybody could come in. And when you entered into that city of refuge, you had the privilege of somebody judicating your situation. It was somebody that was un, um, unbiased, listening, and then judging on the account. Okay? So you were safe. And those cities of refuge could not be on a high hill. They could not be in a low valley. They had to be on level plains because the cripple needed to be able to get there. You, you see what I'm saying? It could, it could not be prejudice against those that were disabled or those that did not um, have. It had to be in a central location on level ground so everybody had the same opportunity. This is, this, everything lends to this. He gives everybody an option, everybody a choice. Mm -hmm. And the whosoever wills, yeah. Are those that say yes. The um, whosoever wants. <laughs> well, 
That, that's right. It's, it's, just, it's just that way. And God does not breach um, the will of his people. Could he? Yes. And sometimes I wonder, you know, why not when they get saved, just bop them in the head and take them on quick, right? <laughs> Have you ever prayed that before? You know, you bet. let's get them in. And when they get in, somebody, would you please? <laughs> take them quick, Lord. Take them quick. Pastor Clark. Oh, no, 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 no. You need to be heard. So, Pastor Clark, speak up. <laughs> in, in the early days of my life, I grew up in the church culture where everything was a sin. Yes, sir. Drinking coffee was a sin, and you're the cheapest yeah. of sinners. Yes, sir. And uh, <laughs> when you the hair was a sin. Yes, because sir. Everything was a sin. That was the culture that I grew up in. Yes, sir. God fearing, God loving. People, no doubt. But that was the culture. No doubt. Okay. Finally, the Holy Spirit, I'm going to give him credit, revealed it to me that if God wanted me so bad, he had sent Jesus to the cross to die for my sin. Yes, sir. He wasn't looking for a reason to get rid of me. That's it. Well said. So, Justin, boy, why don't you preach another hour? So, Pastor Clark, if you wasn't able to hear him, said in his culture, and Pastor Clark's a young guy. But, um, but that culture was years ago, okay? And, and his culture being raised, he said everything was wrong, from cutting your hair to drinking coffee. I even, yeah, chewing, chewing gum in church or drinking a Coca-Cola, I heard, was wrong at that time. And, um, you know, your hair, everything was wrong. And he said Holy Spirit gave him revelation that if... Jesus went through all that he did on the cross. He wasn't looking for a way to keep you out of heaven. He was there so that you could get into heaven. Well, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that so beautifully said. And, and I, I appreciate that, Pastor Clark, so very much. So as far as I'm concerned, everybody in Bay Manette, North Baldwin, Baldwin County, Alabama needs to be saved. And we got our job cut out, right? Amen. We have our job cut out. So it's not my responsibility to save them. That is not on me. It's my responsibility to tell them there is hope in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Those of you watching online, sure to appreciate you sticking with us. I love and appreciate you so very much. We are praying for everybody. Um, and as I go back and read the comments... I pray for those that are asking for prayer and we have those that are homebound that watch and those that travel that watch and um, we just want to say thank you. Um, if you've not shared where you're watching from, please share it. If you think this has helped you, you can like it and share it with others. Give it a thumbs up. I don't know what that does, but it looks pretty cool, right? Um, doesn't, didn't Fonzie said, hey, didn't he do that? <laughs> anyway, I, I would get Daryl to do that uh, impression, but no, I don't think I don't so. Remember. Yes, you do. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. We got to go because I got to give an altar call real quick. <laughs> I love you guys. I look forward to seeing you Sunday here on location. If you can't make it, I'll look for you here online. As always, Bay, let's go have church. God bless you. Mm -hmm.